This morning I'll be reading from Acts 2, verses 36 through 47 in uh, the New King James Version. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and Signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. This is the word of God. Praise be to God. Thank you, David. So today's homecoming, and it's awesome to have homecoming. For having Jersey Mike's, I have to tell you that my homecoming memories have a lot more culinary experience in them than just Jersey Mike's. And we will return to that as soon as we can. Today, I'm starting a series called Why We Love Being Christian. And today, I'd like to talk about being at home in Christ at his table. In the passage that David read, you're reading about the birth of the church. And the real question comes, why form a, group, a new group of people? I mean, back then and today, do you need another group of people? Do you need another thing to do? You need another thing to fit in your schedule, another thing to fit in your budget, another thing to spend time on and, and arrange your life around. And I would just like to tell you that the people who came into the church at this moment and ever since then, the answer is an absolute yes. What people were noticing then when they came to Christ was the world they were in, the, the domination patterns, the empire of the Roman Empire, the empire of the Jewish Christian religion had a hierarchy, had people in charge who would play favorites. Have you noticed anybody playing favorites? Sometimes it happens at home. You can ask the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if there were consequences when you played favorites. And somebody gets a big, pretty jacket with lots of colors and the others don't. See if there's problems playing favorites. Well, people are living in the Roman world and it said that most people were in some kind of servitude uh, with various degrees of suffering and lack of what they needed. And so there were a lot of people in the Roman world ready to hear about something where we, people don't play favorites, where you get together and you don't say some get to have and, and others don't get to have, where some get to be loved and others don't get to be loved. They were really looking for an alternative. And I would like to propose to you that in our world today, people are looking for an alternative to those kind of systems, to those kind of power brokers. I love being at home in Christ at his table. In this passage that David read, what you see is that they continued every day breaking bread together. That didn't only mean that they would sell their goods and make sure everybody had enough to eat. It meant that they would stop every day regularly and say, this bread, remember this, this is the bread and the cup in which we are united. You know, we expect monarchs, we expect government officials. Uh, we even expect, it seems, really religious people 
to play favorites and and do power plays, don't we? It, in fact, in fact, I've heard people comment. The other party, whatever the other party is, is trying to control everything. And and we know how it is how mom and dad try to control everything. We know how it is how the preacher or the bishop or the pope and everybody are trying to control everything. And I just want to tell you that we have the opportunity to notice here in this passage that David read and in our life as Christians that we are offered an alternative, an alternative that 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 values our souls, everyone's soul, equally. That actually decides that everyone is not only worth loving, but is loved. Crazy idea, if you ask me. I just need it. Because every now and then, fairly regularly, quite often, in fact, I disqualify myself for being in because I'm doing everything right. The first thing I want us to say is that we long for other for the life in Christ, not controlling religion. In our tradition, one of the reasons that um, that Alexander Campbell and 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 Barton Stone broke away, it said, it looked like to some people from the the denominations that had been formed and were forming in the Great Awakenings of the United States was because what they found was people would come into faith and then they would be dominated by religious leaders. And our leaders in our tradition said, we don't want that. In fact, one of the things I came to understand when I came into the Christian uh, tradition, our family out of the Baptist world, is that you guys don't value and need preachers as much. It, it, really, I mean, it's, it's good. It's good. Um, I have to say it was a little bit a little bit uneasy at the beginning, but then I thought, no, this is actually right. Because in, my, in the way I understood the tradition in the Baptist world, when preachers were doing their job, ministers were doing their job, they were equipping the church to do the work. And so we had gotten away, we would all agree in, in our traditions that we don't, have a, we don't have clergy that do the work of the church. We have clergy that equip the church to do the work. It would be like parents making slaves of their children and never letting them go. What actually happens is we raise children to leave. We equip children to live their lives. And we long for the life of Christ. So I ask the question, who's in control? Who's in control in your life and who's in control in my life? Who's in control in this fellowship, Wendell Christian Church? And our tradition says we want one answer and only one answer. And that is that we're all seeking for Christ to be in control, for Jesus to be Lord. Right? Not easy. You see, our souls get to choose that. When you get up in the morning and I get up in the morning, we get to decide. Do we turn on the news to tell us how we ought to feel about the day? Or do we spend enough time in prayer, seeking and breathing and letting God define who we are and how we would be in the world? I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting order in our lives. I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting some amount of control over what's in your freezer and what's in your pantry and where you go during the day and who you love and who you don't. I think there's a good being control of that. But I just want you to know that if you decide to turn that control over to someone else, and you will, it would be best if it was Jesus Christ. Now, see, we're all not in control. You know you're not. Just, just wait till you're sick the next time. Just wait till something happens. When you lose a job you didn't see losing, when you are able to find uh, security in, and then you lose your security in some place. I think it's good for us to seek security. But if we let someone else provide a security ab above Jesus Christ, then what we'll do is we'll do whatever they say. Jesus can say love your enemies, but we'll mock our enemies. Because our Lord is not Jesus. Jesus can say, be humble and kind. And we won't be humble and we won't be kind. Because the one who actually is Lord has told us to be mean. And we want to be served. And we want to serve. I just think it's great when Tammy and I are dividing up the week on Friday. When we have our meeting around our calendar. And what we need to do. And who's cooking what meal. and What we're going to do the next week. I just, I love it. I love the fact. But, you know, sometimes I'd, I'd like her to do a little more. Sometimes she'd like me to do a little more. I'd like her to do a little different. You do a little different. And uh, we, we really want to be servants, but we don't want to be slaves. We don't want to lack freedom. So I'd just like to remind you that in Christ you have freedom. Victor Frankl and others have taught us that you can be in, in a concentration camp in the worst of circumstances. And if you maintain your own dignity and your own choice, 
you recognize that how you are in the toughest of circumstances is your choice and who guides that choice. We long for the life of Christ to guide us, not controlling religion, not controlling politics, not the power structures, the principles and the powers and the heavenly places and on earth. Jesus sets us free from that. We long for life in Christ, but not those controlling empires of religion and politics. The other thing is, when we are here as Christians, there's no creed but Christ. No creed but Christ. Back when our tradition was forming, there were plenty of people that were forming creeds. You might be out at a revival meeting out on the frontier, and, and people would accept Jesus Christ, the preaching of John Wesley, or it might be uh, Whitfield, or it might be Benny, or whoever else was preaching. And when they would preach, they would come, then it would be a clamor of all the churches to join us. Join our church, join our church, join our church. And people still think that's all we're wanting. People join our church so they can be in our control. And our leaders said, let's just slow down for a minute, and let's look. Every time you answer the question, what will you believe, and you let someone else answer that question for you, you run the risk. In fact, it will always be true that to some degree, you're not faithful to what Christ is telling you. Have you noticed that Christ can tell you to do one thing early in your life and another thing later in your life? Have you noticed the first time you read the whole Bible, you think certain things, and the next time you read the whole Bible, you think a little different? When you talk to one person about how they view things, you think that makes some sense. And then you talk to another person, that makes more sense. That, that truth, that seems big enough for how I see things. Oh, but that truth is big enough for how everybody sees things. Whoa, this is, this is crazy. I keep changing my mind. I don't know if you do change your mind. You may decide that you really want a power structure that tells you you can't change your mind. Now, there was a time in my life when my way of thinking about God fit more the Reformed tradition, and in the Baptist tradition, you can be what's called a General Baptist or Particular Baptist. General Baptists believe Jesus died for everybody, and everybody can come into Christ, and Particular Baptists mean he only died for the elect. Well, that's just a Reformed died for the elect version, or um, a free church, he died for everybody, and everybody gets to choose. Well, there was a time in my life when I was more a Reformed uh, kind of believer. And so I, I thought when I read the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is what Presbyterian ministers sign to, that they believe it when they become a Presbyterian minister, I read it and I thought, yeah, pretty good. I just want you all to know I wouldn't sign it now. You understand? And it's not that I don't think plenty of faithful people who are walking more faithfully than me wouldn't agree with what's in that statement. But I would just like to say in, in the name of the no creed but Christ, uh, guideline of our tradition is that I'm really glad that I get to have my relationship with Christ, believe what I believe about God, and let others believe what they believe about God, and still love each other. I have good buddies that are Presbyterian ministers and have no desire to leave. I have good friends that are in all these different ways of being, and I'm part of a tradition that says we are all one in Christ. I think there are plenty of people in our communities today who are looking for a place where they can come and just have an authentic relationship with Christ and grow up at their own pace and change their mind when it's time. And I would like to say, you're invited. If you are where you are and you wanna follow Christ, you're welcome. We're right here. When you take the bread and the cup, you are one in Christ, no matter what you're thinking at the moment. No matter how I might agree with you or disagree with you. And some of the people who disagreed with me 20 years ago have helped me see what I think is absolutely true today. <clears throat> you understand? I disagreed with them. I thought thoughts that would sound like mocking because I thought I was right and they were wrong. And it turns out I needed to learn what they had to say. I think we're all sinners. What do y'all think? I think, I think we all miss, miss out on some part of what God wants us not only to know, but to experience and to do. And I think sinners need to be saved. They need to be saved, not just in the sense of going to heaven when you, when you die. <clears throat> That's more of a mystery to me than ever. 
But I can tell you that you need to be saved from how you do it and how I do it. We need to be saved from the ways we ruin this world, how we foul our nests, how we uh, alienate our neighbors. We need to be saved from that. There's enough damage being done, and Jesus Christ comes in. And if you read the passage that David read really slow, multiple times, imagine it. Let your prefrontal cortex be led by the Holy Spirit. Imagine people from all these diverse places loving each other. And you just met somebody, and you sell your couch to feed them. No creed but Christ. That's what leads us to live a life like Christ. I think we're also children who need to grow up, don't y'all? In fact, Jesus said, if you want to get into what I'm talking about, if you want to understand it, you're going to have to be children. You're going to have to start with an open, humble approach and just say, teach me. And that is who we are. And we are here with no creed but Christ growing up. I remember a long ride with my father on a U-Haul truck, 24 hours in a U-Haul truck uh, coming from Arkansas to North Carolina. And he and I, I finally had the guts to tell him my experience of being raised by him in the negative sense. I always appreciate it and still do appreciate the good things, but there were some rough parts in our relationship. I don't know. Y'all may have had parents with no rough parts. That's great. Bless your heart. Just that'd be great. But um, I'd, I'd, I was able to tell my dad my experience, and he was able to tell me what was going on in his heart at the moment in which these things happened. And by the time those 24 hours were over, I understood my dad better than ever. I had grown up into my dad's love in ways that I needed to, but what it took was me to stop and get to know my actual father. Stop creating a version of my dad in my head that I could hate or like just depending on how it fit my adolescent whim. Actually get to know my father. Get to know what made him do what he did, made him do what he did on other times. When my dad would be what I would consider inconsistent. Maybe you've read the whole Bible and noticed that it doesn't seem to always be the same way. In the Bible. Have you noticed? And some people will come along and say, oh, that's just your imagination. It actually says the same thing all the time, which was me with my dad. I would say, to, you know, I'd say, well, I have a great dad. And I would just talk about the great things. And they'd say, well, uh, wasn't that a bruise? <laughs> well, yeah, but I deserve it. Well, really? Did you have anything to get over? What if we actually found out that God loved us, that if we understood the anxieties of our fathers, of our parents, we would understand them better? But what if we found out that if we understood God, God wouldn't be threatening us at all? What if we understood God completely and understood that God loved us every minute of every day in everything we do? And that doesn't keep God from understanding and seeing the, the harm that we do ourselves and others, but it certainly keeps God from pulling away from us and rejecting us. And Jesus hangs there on the cross and says, I'm not going to reject you. Do whatever you choose to do. I will not stop loving you. Do whatever you choose to do, and I will not stop loving you. Do whatever, ever, and I will not stop. And when we meet together with no creed but Christ and take the bread and the cup, we say to one another, no matter where you are and what you're doing, sinners learning to be saved, children learning to grow up, we love each other, right like we are as we're learning. And so the third thing is we gather at the table. How do we stay faithful together? How do we keep reminding ourselves of the things that will keep us together? Our tradition made a choice, and it's, in, it's consistent with the choice of the early church. As in this passage that da David read, their, their practice, when they would get together, they would remember the bread and the cup. And they might have sweet potato pie. But whatever they were doing, they met inside the table of Christ, that Christ brought us together. A Disciples of Christ minister, uh, Rita Brock is her name, wrote a book called Saving Paradise. It's very intellectual. She spent a lot of time traveling around looking at the ancient gathering places of the early church, where people were gathering before the Roman world took over, the Roman Empire took over, when people were gathering early church and having communion. And their images were the images of the Garden of Eden. 
and everyone was welcome at the table. Later, after the Roman Empire took over, can you imagine an empire takes over? Now you have to you have to check off a bunch of lists in order to be welcome at the table. And you have to confess sins and be exactly right before you can take the, the bread and the cup. Can you imagine that happened? Well, it happened. And by the Council of Chalcedon, it was solidified. And so what do we do? We get to decide. Do we take the version of the Christian tradition of the Roman Empire? Or do we do the version of the, of the Christian church before the Roman Empire took over? And when we do, we gather at the table. And how do we stay together? Every time we gather, we gather to take communion. And remember, no matter where you are, how you're growing up, how fast you're growing up, how far away you wandered before you showed up today, the bread and the cup remind us we're all in Christ. We come to Christ every time we gather. I remember reading for the first time in one of the history books of our tradition when I took that class from Lexington Seminary that the, the Christian churches, uh, disciples of Christ, meet to share communion. You understand other traditions meet to recite the creeds. Other, church, other churches meet to uh, hear a sermon. We actually get together to share communion because we don't want the preacher or anyone else to get cocky and think that they're in charge or that they get to tell us what to believe. No, in this free church tradition that we're part of, any one of us gets to tell what we believe. And we can have a place for clergy to study and to help teach the church. But in no way do clergy tell us and dictate to us. No hierarchy dictates to us what we believe. Come here to your first love. Come here to communion, your first family. In fact, what I could say is that the early church, being Christian was the noun of their life, their identity. And then everything else was, uh, was an adjective. So I am a fuller Christian, fuller family, but I'm Christian. When the fullers vary from the Christian faithfulness that I understand, they lose. The fullers don't win all. I'm an American Christian, and I can move and work so that my, my nation comes in harmony with Christ because I am, by definition, making the world into, in my life and in every association I have, into the kingdom of God as Jesus Christ preached. The, name, the noun of our lives is Christian. I just thought I'd tell you one story, and then I want to share a song. I'm going to call her Loretta. Not a real name, but she's a real person. She came and talked to me, and she joined one of our small groups in our church. It was a small group called Making Peace with Your Past. And it's a really beautiful study about noticing the dysfunctions in our family and the ways that generational problems and sin and, and toxic relationships are passed on and how we can actually make peace with the fact that our parents weren't perfect. If you had perfect parents, you can just take a break from listening. But if you had parents that weren't perfect, then you have to make peace with the fact that your parents weren't perfect, but God is. And you want to actually bring your way of viewing yourself and the world into harmony with what God says and sees, rather than what you were taught in your family. To whatever degree you have to correct the interpretation you had of yourself and the world from your home where you grew up or your lack of having a home, Loretta joined Making Peace with Your Past, and I remember sitting there in the group, and for seven weeks, she never said a word, and we had, the, we had the commitment that you didn't have to talk, so I remember thinking, I wish Loretta was participating more. I remember thinking, I wish she would just, she, maybe she's not reading her lesson, and so she's not comfortable answering questions because she's not prepared, the kind of thing, I would be quiet if I hadn't prepared, but if I've prepared, I'm going to talk. So I didn't really understand her silence, but over the course of seven weeks, silence, silence, silence. Before and after, she's uh, saying, you know, cordial and saying hi and goodbye and even saying thank y'all for, for, for letting me be here and things like that. And I was like, okay, but why didn't she participate? Come week eight, things broke. Everything changed. Loretta said, I think I finally believe that you guys really love me. I think I'm changing my mind about 
this Christian thing. I was raised by a dad who was physically abusive. He would put a gun to my head and tell me what to do. He'd lock me in a closet and leave me there while he went to church and worked as a deacon. I didn't understand the Christian faith. In fact, the version of the Christian faith I had was really bad, and I wanted to stay away from church. But when I was there, I would hear the preacher say things, and I would think, I wish love was like that, but it wasn't like that at my house. So I really worked hard to be pretty. I really worked hard to be smart. And she was a medical professional. She was someone who had succeeded in learning and finding her way. But she was filled with anxieties, always performance, always wanting to keep her daddy from being mad and keeping her boss from being mad. And everybody, including God, she had to satisfy because things got bad if the one in charge got mad. She said, in my spiritual life, I really didn't know what to do. All I knew was some of the things that I would hear Christians say I believed, and some of the things I heard Christians say I didn't believe. But I actually believe you guys want me to just be honest. I really want to believe Jesus loves me. And you guys make me think he might. By the end of that study, she had done a shift. She had decided to let Jesus speak for Jesus. She had decided to let God be God. And everything began to change in Loretta's life. The third thing she said was, when our daughter was born, I desperately wanted to love our daughter different than I was loved. And I didn't know how to do it. But now, with Jesus' help, I think my daughter might know what love really looks like. I think we really need Jesus, nothing else. And everything else that would, would distract us from Jesus needs to be put in its place. And that would mean that we would just come to Jesus, and every week, that's what we try to do. I was uh, at a wedding yesterday and sat next to some friends, and they were going to go see... Um, Fernando Ortega uh, in concert um, in a few days, and it would just, my mind was just, you got to love some uh, Fernando Ortega. and wounded, sick and sore, Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. We Oh. 
laden, lost and ruined by the fall. Let's pray. Or there's a temptation to run to a hundred places to decide who we are, how we'll be in the world. But I thank you for a tradition that has decided that we will come to you. There are temptations to think once we've figured some things out that that's the way things really are. Hold on to them so tightly that we can't see a bigger reality of your love or bigger reality of how you work in the world. But thank you that we can come and share the bread and share the cup each week. Thank you that we can come back to you. And in the midst of all that foolishness of chasing a thousand things, we come to you and to your arms. And we come to be loved by you and to love one another with the same love you love us with. So now be with us. Thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for homecoming. Thank you for reminding us that we are one in you that you love us all the time, that now and throughout all eternity, we are yours and your love, your cross, your resurrection are sufficient. Thank you for the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Amen.